All right, guys. So uh, today's gonna be just a tad bit longer. Um, we haven't. I say longer. It's not. It's not too bad. Um, we left off talking about uh, relief. Um, I told you guys we're gonna look at recovery and reform. I lied. Uh, today we're going to look at recovery and recovery only. So, well, recovery, and we're gonna work our way to uh, the demagogue section. So. Based off your stuff, we're going from slides 49 to um, 67. So, um, all right. So, again, when we talk about um, when we talk about uh, relief, I gave you guys the hurricane example. Sorry, dogs. I hear my mouth. Anyway, um, give you guys the hurricane example. Um, I'm do the same thing for recovery. So, basically, uh, when you think about a hurricane, you think about recovery, right? If relief is that emergency action, right, just to help people survive, recovery is going to be the things that help you kind of bounce back from the uh, the hurricane and kind of reestablish the society, right? Um, Spoiler alert, reform is going to be the things that you put into place to make sure it doesn't happen again, right? So, um, again, if you're working through that chart, recovery, as a definition, is going to be the things that uh, they, it is it is the things put in place to help revamp society uh, or, again, kickstart society and make sure that everything's fine and it, you know, people are getting back to normal. So, some of the programs for recovery. Oh, hold on. Just a uh, just an admin note. I noticed that the New Deal graphic organizer is actually incorrect in the way that I did. Um, so I have relief is Bank Holiday, Fira, and the CWA. Right. Um, I put reform with AAA, NRA, C, and TVA, that actually needs to be recovery. So switch those around. So it should be recovery for AAA, NRA, C, and TVA. And then reform should be Social Security, Wagner Act, WPA, NLRA. All right? Um, just to be clear. So don't, don't get confused. I just put the wrong words in the wrong thing. So all you have to do is switch those around to make sure that you guys are um, kind of tracking what I'm saying. So... All right, so slide 50. Let's talk about this thing called the AAA, Agricultural Adjustment Act, all right? Um, this is not the people that come get you on the side of the road if you're broken down, right? This is a totally different program. Um, so basically, here's the deal. Uh, with the AAA, farmers are actually paid to cut production. We talked about uh, the economic idea of what is making – uh, the agricultural area of society fail and struggle. And one of the things that we talked about is overproduction. So with the AAA, um, farmers are actually paid to cut down production. And the reason for that is, again, when you overproduce, it makes the prices cheap. Farmers are producing mass amounts of food and they are getting like no money back for it um, because, again, the price of food is so low because of overproduction. So, see, I haven't changed. Still do that here just like I do it in class. Um, all right. So, there are basically farmers that are not growing, and some of them are actually even destroying the land and the crops that they have started growing. Um, so they're actually making money to not do their jobs or to do them as much, right? So one of the reasons that this is is because, again, we've seen with the Dust Bowl, bad agricultural practices of overproduction, it's hurting the ground. So if you destroy crops and you let them rot on the ground, actually a lot of nutrients are put back into the soil, so that way they can grow better crops later on also um, and most importantly is because of the economy. So uh, yeah, 
there are some seriously unintended consequences with the AAA that people are not prepared for. Um, and again, if we were in class, I would just ask you what that is. If you mull it over and you think about it, think about the situation of the country and kind of what is going on. And you guys will realize that, again, farmers are destroying food. Um, and they are doing this in order to make food more expensive. And again, if you go to slide 51, um, people are literally starving to death. And there is food being destroyed that could be given away, right? Also, nobody has a job. And that's that's an exaggeration. There's a ton of unemployment and there's a ton of underemployment. If you don't know the difference, unemployment is when you don't have a job. Underemployment is if somebody like me, like who grand I've been to school for what was supposed to be four years, made it eight, um, or somebody like that has a master's degree or a doctorate is working at somewhere like McDonald's, right? They're very educated and they are underemployed because they're very qualified for something. Or like a mechanic, um, if he's, I don't know, sweeping streets, right? He has a skill. And he's not being able to use it because of the way the economy is, because of the way that jobs are. Um, that is underemployment, right? Not having a job or having a job that you're overqualified for. That's underemployment. So you have mass unemployment and mass underemployment in the country, right? Um, and you are destroying food that could be given out to save people who are starving to death and you're raising the prices of food for people who don't have a job or are not making enough money to sustain themselves and their families. Um, now, granted, the farmers end up benefiting from this, and it does help the agricultural thing, but long term, it actually fails, and this is very important to understand, um, is because it's ruled unconstitutional. All right, Now, that is going to play into something that is going to come later, really that ends the New Deal, and we'll talk kind of about about that so um it's important to to understand again that triple a is ruled unconstitutional so again if it's a success or a failure um in that chart you can put that it fails because it's ruled unconstitutional you can also put that it succeeds because it actually helps out agriculture and whatnot so um anyway okay go to slide 52 never mind skip slide 52 normally um, or, I mean, hey, do it if you want to. I think it's funny, so you can pause the video and do it. Um, I literally was reading this when I made the slideshow, and I was like, that's hilarious. I'm going to put that in there because I'm that teacher. All right, so slide 53, the triple C. Now, look, this is very pertinent to you guys with the area that you live in. Triple C did a lot of work in the South, um, and it's <laughs> – I, I think this is probably one of the best programs that FDR did Um and again, you know, you keep that original lesson in mind about how much government is too government or too much government, and then that idea of the uh, social contract and the state of nature cycle that we talked about on that very first day. Um, you start thinking about these programs and the things that they're doing, and you start asking yourself, how much government are we letting into our personal lives, right? Um, but with Triple C, let's just kind of run through this, all right? Triple C runs from 1935 to 1941. Those dates are very specific, right? 35, not as much, but 41 is specific. If you're thinking ahead, this might be one of the things that's going to help you answer a later question, all right? So here's the deal. The Triple C takes very young men, 18 to 25 years old, all right? Um, it targets them specifically because a lot of them have not had jobs, right? Um skilled or unskilled, but 18 to 25 year old men have not really had careers or jobs that they learned a lot in. So they're unskilled. It puts them out in the wilderness and they do hard labor. They will cut down trees. They cut trails. Um, if any of you guys are into hiking, you go up to the Okoy. There is a ton of trails up there that is cut by the, uh, the triple C. And you, there's actually some of them you can see markers where it puts, like, it's it's a triple C trail. Um, I find that really interesting. I'm a huge fan of going outside and hiking around and all that stuff. Not as much camping because I do that for work. But um, triple C is, it's a very interesting program for a couple reasons. Um, one, because of 
it, I will, again, if you're filling out your chart, spoiler alert, this is a mass success. It's very successful in more ways than one. Um, but two, just because of the way it targets people and how they use their, their, um, force, right? So it sends tens of thousands of very, very young, unexperienced men who are young enough and strong enough to work hard labor and they send them out in the middle of nowhere. And it's got a bunch of city kids, right? So people from like New York city are put out in the wilderness of Massachusetts or wherever they're sending them. And they do government work that is very hard labor. It is long days. And you're probably thinking, how is this, you know, a success? Well, here's the deal. These people are paid. Oh, you can go to slide 54. I'm going to kind of skip around on my points. They're paid $25 a month because they're in the middle of nowhere. There's nowhere to spend your money. This happened the same thing when I was overseas. There wasn't much to spend money on. So pretty much every dime that I made, um, I would put it towards my student loans or put it in my savings account. I kept just a little bit of money to spend for, you know, if something came along or there was something in the shop or I wanted some extra food or whatever. Um, but they were paid $25 a month. They would send $20 of that home. So now they are helping reboot the economy because those people at home in the cities have that money to either spend or save. Um, and they would keep $5 for themselves. Additionally, this is very successful because they don't spend much on this program. They get more out of it. Granted, they're they're cutting down trees, which is helpful in some ways for you know businesses and whatnot. They're cutting trails, which albeit recreational or travel, is going to help the actual society, the United States society. Um, and uh, they're actually teaching people to read and write while they're there. So you'd go work, and then at night you would go to school. And so you're bettering society, you're helping the economy, and you're bettering yourself because you're learning to read, you're learning to write. Um, additionally, there's people that have got to be hired that know how to read and write to teach these guys how to read and write. Also, they're not spending money on housing or clothing for these guys because they're giving them excess. All right. So one of the things that we've talked about is the overproduction in World War I um, in our last unit, right? We were really, really good at making stuff and we were providing for ourselves. We were providing for Britain and France. So with that, there is an excess of uniforms and military equipment that's not being used because right now we're focused all on our domestic issues of the depression, right? So, um, I don't know how to put it. So basically, again, somebody had the broad idea and said, Hey, we've got all this excess military stuff laying around. Like, let's go, let's go put it to use. All right. These guys out here in the triple C that are working out in the middle of nowhere, they need clothing because those of you who have done manual labor or cut down trees before you get, Get your clothes torn up pretty quick, right? So, um, yeah, uh, they're clothing them in old stuff, and, and it's saving money, and they're clothing in, or they're using old tents to house them. Um, so again, they're they're saving money because they're not really spending much. They're bettering society by cutting down some of these trees, cutting trails for travel or recreation or whatever it may be. They are paying these guys who are throwing that money back into the economy because they're sending it home and they're bettering them as people because they're teaching them to read, which is going to later on help out society. Because again, if you're an employer at this time, it would be like the equivalent of having your high school diploma. If you can read and write, that's amazing. Um, so next slide, slide 55. Um, here's the thing. This also works for black people. And there's a reason that this is so successful um, now, granted, we talked about the idea of Dixiecrats versus Democrats, right? Southern Democrats, we call them Dixiecrats versus Democrats. Now, Roosevelt is from the North, all right? And that's going to cause some problems from him later on with the Democratic Party. But he's a tad bit more reformed. And Roosevelt thinks, hey, look, we cannot just do programs for white people, all right? We have to help out black people because they're still Americans, Um now, granted, about social status and equality and all that, we won't touch that um, as far as his thoughts. But at the same time, he still saw a need to provide for people, not by color, right? Now, granted, your camps are still segregated. Um, 
your work teams are still segregated, but the opportunities were equal, all right? Black people could work for the CCC, white people could work for the CCC, but they kept them separated. Um, so that way, again, black people are able to make that money and send it home and kind of also, again, participate in the economy. Um, it's highly controversial because, again, whites feel like they should be the priority, but at the same time, I mean, it's still a success. And again, if you're filling the chart out, make sure you notate that the triple C is a huge success. So it runs from 35 to 41. In 1941, the question is on slide 55, where do those workers go? Well, if you're thinking ahead, and we'll talk about it uh, in the next unit, but 1941 is when Pearl Harbor happens. Um, Pearl Harbor marks the beginning of the First World War. So what you have now is guys who are used to sleeping in these tents. They're used to hard manual labor and that pride aspect of the United States. People still got up and served. And when there was a war, people volunteered for it. So um, good water. Um, so the thing is, is that the triple C ends up dumping a ton of people into the workforce, um, or not the workforce, but the military. A lot of these guys just, they're used to it. They get up and join the army. They're used to hard labor. They are semi-educated. They're obviously well enough to do manual labor. So they're going to be fit for service, pending they haven't got hurt. Um, so yeah, the triple C ends up dumping tens of thousands of workers into the military who are, they're now in shape. They're used to manual labor and they can, most of them can read and write. So it's a pretty great deal for them. Um, and again, long-term it helps the government out. And so you see the triple C end up becoming essentially like almost a recruitment tool. All right. So next slide, uh, 56. Now NRA, <laughs> I had a college professor that would teach this class as if the NRA was the National Rifle Association, and he would talk about the NRA from the New Deal, the National Recovery Act, not the National Rifle Association, but he would talk about it as if it was the National Rifle Association, and people were super confused, and it was hilarious, because I knew he was wrong, and he was just doing it to have fun, and of course, at the end of the class, he told us, he was like, you know, you're all stupid, like, the NRA is not the National Rifle Association during the Depression, so, um, I will tell you, the NRA, and if you look at the caricature, that's, or not the caricature, but the little political cartoon that I've got on slide 56, it's got a guy holding a thing that says Constitution, right? And the, the bird um, with the NRA jacket doesn't really understand what he's saying. Um, he's blind to it, and again, you see it in the, the pocket, the coat pocket of the guy, it says Supreme Court. Um, again, Supreme Court is about to come in major at the end of the... Um, New Deal. So if the NRA had worked, it would change our economy and we would look vastly different. And the reason for that is it's a socialist idea. So let's say, I can't really call names on here, so let's say all three of my blocks are, um, they make shoes. All right, so let's say first block makes Nikes. Um, excuse me. First block, yeah, fourth block makes, uh, we'll say Chacos, right? You guys make sandals. And then uh, fifth block, you guys make Adidas, right? Um, basically, what would happen is businesses would get together, and you can go ahead and go to slide 57, all right? Every industry would write a code. <clears throat> so if uh, in that industry, like, they would say, okay, from now on, Nike, you're making tennis shoes. Chacos, you can only make uh, boots. And Adidas, you can only make sandals, right? Um, the code indicates the industry's division and what how it's divided up, all right? So here's the thing. The NRA was optional. It was an optional program. You did not have to participate, but... Like we talk about um, in the progressive era with uh, whatever that – I can't remember what the, the program was that essentially would put labels on products of companies that were you know, participating in using uh, labor that was uh, – how do you say it? Like kind of 
products are made in a safe environment, right? You didn't have to participate in the NRA, but when you did, they would put a little label on your product. Those who participated got the label, and it showed, hey, these guys support the New Deal, which means they support FDR, which means they support getting out of the Depression, right? If you were a company that didn't, it looked really bad. It showed, hey, this guy's not an NRA member. He must not be, like, pro getting out of the Depression. We probably shouldn't buy his product, right? People would kind of be standoffish <clears throat> about that. So, um, additionally, if you look at that next point, it says that codes benefit big companies, all right? So you think about the three examples I gave you, Nikes, Adidas, and Chacos. <clears throat> so who is going to write that code for the industry? Well, it's going to be somebody like Nike and Adidas. Chaco's not really going to have a say in it. Again, we all know that Chaco makes a really good sandal, right? They're probably not that, I mean, I think Chaco makes boots. I don't really know. But their specialty is definitely not boots. They're very good at making sandals. But now Adidas just got the right to sandals, all right? So Nikes and Adidas are going to be the ones that are going to benefit from that. And people like Chaco's, if they don't comply, they're pushed out. So, again, if the NRA had stayed in power and worked a lot of really small companies would be put out of business. I know you guys probably don't know who Ultra is, but that's who I buy my running shoes from, right? Ultra makes amazing running shoes. Um, and you guys have probably never heard of them. and They would be pushed out. So would people like uh, Brooks. Brooks makes one product. They make a good running shoe. Um, heaven forbid, guys. Crocs, gone. All right? Nobody has Croc running shoes because it's – they're awful, right? Um, that would be a terrible thing. But again, Crocs is a small industry would be pushed out because Nikes and Adidas are are the ones who are writing the codes. So again, it would have totally reshaped because it's a very socialist idea. So, um, all right. 58, WPA, the Works Progress Administration. Um, so yeah, oh, to go back to 57, just understand it fails. People abandon it. It's ruled unconstitutional, just like... Uh, the AAA, just like, uh, what was the other one? Um, no, excuse me, just the AAA. All right, so it's ruled unconstitutional. Just understand that. And again, the Supreme Court is the one who rules that understand, uh, unconstitutional, right? So just to be clear, off, also, we'll kind of go into the role of the Supreme Court and all of this and what they actually do as far as their job as Supreme Court justice, right? <clears throat> so WPA, <coughs> Works Progress Administration. Um, so this is a mastery, massive recovery project for um, a wide variety of Americans, all right? Different things happen here, and it's more of that kind of progressive idea of how do we make society better? Well, one of the things we're going to do is improve roads. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have driven through places like Alabama in the last couple months but their roads are really bad right they could use some improvement um if you flash forward really quick to slide 59 um as bad as the roads were in alabama they're nothing compared to the picture you're looking at here so on slide 59 you're looking at a picture of what roads used to look like here's the thing too for our area if you lived in the tennessee valley right um tva was kind of this is gonna be the next one we talk about it's it's kind of coming about um but we had massive flooding you have massive flooding and dirt roads um they don't mix very well so if you put the two together granted you get kind of this picture right here you see how bogged down that car is in the mud plus they're old cars it's not like you're driving four-wheel drive trucks and stuff um so it is they improve roads, right? So there's one thing they do. They also do public works. They are the ones who make statues and parks. Again, they are progressing society. It is kind of the, again, he's kind of, it's so thematic that I would actually wear the shirt that I did. It's Teddy Roosevelt riding a moose, right? FDR, granted, don't forget, Teddy Roosevelt ran as a Republican, right? FDR, his cousin, runs as a Democrat, but he never kind of actually loses that progressive idea, right? So it's, not, it's kind of something that's copied with the New Deal and you see it. The way that we progress society. The WPA is a great example. We improve roads. Well, after that, we build statues. We build parks. Now, do we need statues and parks to survive as a society? Absolutely not. But are people getting jobs? Yes. Is it making society better because it's 
beautifying and making things more aesthetically pleasing, 100%. Um, another thing is literacy programs. Look, we've already talked about education statuses, right? People are quitting school to go to work because they're trying to provide for a family and keep their family afloat. So guess who's having trouble keeping a job? It's going to be teachers. Um, so literacy programs, there's two sides because one, you are hiring people to read and write, just kind of like in the C, uh, triple C, right? You're hiring people that learn to read and write and you are teaching people in society to read and write. This is advancing us as a society. Um, it's kind of, there, there's an argument for socializing education in the United States. And one of the reasons that people say is because it'll pay off. If you gave free college to every person, every person that went to college would get a degree, they would become smarter, and it would advance us as a society. We would progress forward. So, um, again, you're teaching people to read and write with the literacy program, and you're hiring people to teach those people to read and write. So it's it's two-pronged. Um, the arts, again, you got to think. Musicians, artists, uh, sculptors, all these people who... That's the way that they survive. Nobody's paying them to do this work right now during the Depression. So the WPA comes along and say, hey, you know what? We can use you. Paint murals, sculpt things, uh, play music, whatever it may be. Um, and the last one, of course, it's very near and dear to my heart, is historians. Um, this is probably one of the greatest things that comes out of the Depression, in my opinion, because we had a piece of history that was almost very much lost. Now, we know that slavery... And the Civil War is over in 1865, right? That is the end of the Civil War. We start Reconstruction. Um, we're now talking about the 1930s. So slaves are getting old, or former slaves, excuse me, are getting old. Um, and they, uh, they don't really... You guys know, like, when people get older, their minds start to go a little bit. So this is our last-ditch effort. Um, to kind of get an account for slaves. Um, now you got to think those who really experienced slavery would have been about 18 to 20 years old. And that was in 65, 1865. They would, you know, be that age. So you got to do that plus another 50 years. So you're talking about 70, 80 year old people who are trying to recount their lives as former slaves, um, to really get a feel. And so, it's, it's a very good thing that comes out of this because we get that account and we are able to, as historians, as Americans, kind of like have that recorded piece of history. You know, granted, it's not something that we're super proud of as the United States, but at the same time, it is an important mark and it's it's important to understand that stand on our history because, again, if you don't, you those things are forgotten. Um, so uh, now go to... Slide 60. Oh, yeah. WPA uh, is considered a, a success. It's um, it's kind of a, uh, you know, it's good because it gets a wide variety of people in the United States who might have been jobless, kind of that option, right? So go to slide 60. Um, TVA. This is something you guys should all be pretty familiar with. Um, it's something that is pertinent and very specific to uh, our area. And again, when you guys get to the project, you gotta you gotta think about what it would be like for different people in different regions. TVA is going to apply to us specifically as Southerners and as Tennesseans and specifically Chattanoogans, right? Um, so the TVA is, it falls both under recovery and relief. And recovery, because when you... Um, or excuse me, relief is building the dams, right? Flooding at this point in time is disastrous for the Tennessee Valley. Um, so here's what we should do right now. Go ahead and go to slide. We're going to go through slide 61 through 65. All right, so go to slide 61. I want you guys to look at that. If you don't recognize that area and you want to get out of the house, go down Glass Street in Chattanooga. Look up on one of the buildings, you will see the Andrews Co., LB Andrews Co., I think is what it is, right? It's down on Glass Street, right? That's how flooded that area of town used to get from the river. Now, when you get there, think about how far you are from the river, all right? Or maybe even stop and look at your GPS 
scroll out and see how far you are from the river. Now, granted, that's that's crazy far from the river, right? But this is, again, this is before damming, so we have no control over it. When it rained in Tennessee, you guys have seen the last couple weeks, it's rained like crazy. I know the front of my neighborhood has been closed a couple times, and one time it stayed closed for about two or three weeks because of the crazy water levels, right? That's Glass Street. That's very, very far from the river. Go to the next one. I don't remember exactly where this is. I think this is over in... Um, Kind of about uh, around Mock Stadium. I can't remember for sure. Um, I can see the building in my mind with a Coke sign on it um, that you see in, in slide 62. But I don't remember exactly where in downtown Chattanooga that is. But again, that is a picture of downtown. Um, and again, you think about, if I, I would give anything to remember where this building's at. Um, man, it's my dad. He used to work down kind of around that area. So... Uh, Again, this is just part of where the river just kind of runs up into the city. Um, slide 63. That is closer to downtown. Um, and again, think about that should be, I don't remember. I think that's around Alton Park. Uh, that's where that one was at. Um, but again, very far from the river. Some stuff to think about. Uh, 64, that's a picture of the Chickamauga Dam while it was being built. So this is a very, very old picture. Um, and yeah, slide 65 also uh, part of the dam being built. Um, slide 66, I lied, we're going to go to 66. Um, so I'll tell you guys a quick story about this one. I know I'm trying to keep it short. We're about a half hour right now. So, um, Parksville Dam, if you don't know where that's at, if you're driving up, uh, into the Okoy to go hiking, to see all those triple C trails I just told you guys about. Parksville Dam is right there on your right. Stop, pull off and look at, there's a sign TVA and you can see it. You can actually see how like huge that dam is. It's very, very big as far as height, right? Um, and it's crazy to look at because there's a huge lake on one side and then you look and it's like a million foot drop. That's an exaggeration. but And then the Okoy, the bottom part of the Okoy River kind of runs through there. It's amazing. But what's awesome about Parksville, uh, the Parksville Dam, is when they dammed it, the rumor is, um, and if you don't know, Parksville Lake actually has an entire like town underwater because when they dammed it, it flooded the entire town. Um, and the rumor is, is that they... Uh, the prison, they actually never emptied the prison out and they left all the um, criminals in there and they drowned them all. And so there's supposed to be rumors about it being haunted or whatever. I think it'd make a cool haunted house except for that whole part where it's up under the water. So um, that's just a kind of a cool story about Parksville Lake. But anyway, so bounce back to slide 60. Um, we'll talk our way through this and then we'll finish up. So uh, TVA, uh, it falls under your relief and recovery. Again, relief because they're building dams. They are giving people that relief from the massive flooding. And again, it is paying people to get those type of jobs, right? Um, again, this is following the huge flood safety industry that takes over. Um, and my question is, what do dams make? Well, if you don't know, dams make electricity, right? You run water through there and... I don't know how it works, guys. I, I do history, not science, right? But it turns something that uh, produces electricity, right? This is why we got cheap electricity in the Tennessee Valley. Um, so, uh, again, that industry takes over and you kind of, you get that payoff. So, um, go to slide 67, right? You get cheap electricity because it's a natural occurrence, right? You're not having to fuel or do anything. The natural flow of water through those dams are going to produce the electricity that's that's being made. And it helps people because now you've got cheaper electricity, which makes it more affordable. So my question is, who owns TVA? Um, this is going to play into a success or failure. Um, spoiler alert, it's kind of both. Um if you and you guys maybe live on the water, uh, if you don't know, TVA can actually go into your house. So say you lived on the lake, right, and you have a boat dock um, that stretches, you know, 30, 40 feet out of the water, whatever it is. Um, TVA can actually come in and tear that down without asking uh, because they own the water. And they can actually dig like six feet up in your yard, I think, something like that. Um, and the reason for that is is because it's 
government backed, right? Um, but if any of you guys have family that maybe works at TVA, there's there's this very strange balance of power at TVA where it's half government, half private industry. So again, it's problematic because the public kind of fears that because they don't really know exactly who owns it. It's kind of it's kind of government. It's kind of private industry at the same time. TVA is wildly successful, all right? It does exactly what it's meant to do. It produces cheap electricity, gives people jobs, um, controls flooding. It does all those great things, but it's never repeated because of that balance of power. So it's a success, but at the same time, it's a failure because of um, because of kind of that, that balance, right? So uh, that's it as far as material today. I do really quick want uh, to uh, bounce back to the question I asked you guys about the banking holiday, which was what FDR actually does. Um, the answer to that is while he doesn't physically do anything, FDR totally restores confidence in, um, in the program. So that's really like the main thing you should take away from the bank holiday, right? So if you're writing uh, success or failure, you should put it's a success because FDR restores confidence that people have in the banks. Now, I think I may have told you guys about when my grandfather passed away about him having like just rat hold cash because he never trusted a bank again. And granted, eventually my grandparents had a bank, but they were very leery of it uh, because they lived through the depression. Right. So, um, yeah, it, uh, it's, it's important to kind of understand that, that, and when you look at the whole pandemic thing that's going on, President Trump's been on the TV every day, and he's just talking to the public. Most of the time, it's very repetitive. Uh, if you guys have watched it or tuned in, um, if you haven't, I would suggest maybe watching two or three days, you know, and just for a little bit. They go on for about an hour and a half, but President Trump just talks to people, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's what's happening. Granted, you know, yeah, it might be bad, but it's not really that bad. It's the same idea that FDR used, which is he's just talking to the people, trying to keep them calm and make them understand, hey, look, we're doing something, but... Like, you know, the situation is not as bad as you think. So he's restoring confidence. So with the banking holiday, all he does is close his banks for a few days and then boom, they are, uh, they're, you know, right back on track. So, all right, um, for your assignment today, I know granted this has been a bit, bit of a longer lecture. I'm going to post a video along with this that talks about underground Chattanooga. And I don't know how many of you guys know anything about this kind of bouncing back to the TVA idea. Sorry, I know I've been a little scatterbrained, but um, I just want you guys to watch the video. Um, it's something you guys may not know about the city. Uh, if you didn't know, there's actually a few blocks that we actually built on top of each other. Um, so there's a guy in the video, uh, Dr. Nicholas Honerkamp. He, when I was at UTC, he was one of my professors there, an anthropology guy, very, very bright man. Um, he's a little bit crazy too. He would just kind of stand on his head and play guitar sometimes in class. He was, he was wild, but um, yeah, watch the video and kind of maybe see some stuff that you guys are maybe didn't know about your city. So that's all I got for today. Thanks for sticking for me or sticking around for me. I know it was long, but, um, yeah, so tomorrow we'll talk a little bit more about the new deal and whatnot, and we'll start wrapping things up and kind of closing out the depression. Have a good one.